Hi, Hermione. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, Very Karen. nice to be here. Hi. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Michael. Thank you um, to the previous panelists. I've been looking forward to this conversation for months too, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, I think we said we would talk a little bit, as did yesterday's um, panelists, about how we first came to how we came to write our first books. And in your case, do you want to go first, Hermione? It's Cather. It's it's Wolf rather than Cather, correct? Well, um, first of all, I just want to say um, how, how pleased I am virtually to be back in the Beinecke and, and at Yale, and I wish I was really there, and also to thank Karen. Um, I had a very happy time working in the Beinecke on the papers of Edith Wharton, so um, it's, it's, it's very nice virtually to be back. Yes, I, I think I started out as a, a literary critic and a teacher of literature, um, and I wrote books on Bowen and Wolf and 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 then and then on Cather. And I think in the 80s and late 80s, early 90s, I was really moving towards biography. Uh, possibly, I'm not sure about this, but possibly as a way of avoiding the the wilder reaches of uh, post-structuralism and um, uh, literary theory, which a language which I never really felt very at home in. I think I've always wanted as a writer and a teacher to, to speak the same language when I'm talking to people who like books as members of the general public as, as I would in the classroom or as I would on the page. So I've not been very good at specialized languages. Um, and yes, uh, I got, I've always been, I'd always been very interested in Wolf and talked to her a lot and thought and written a little book about her novels, which was very early on for me. And I got very fascinated with what she had to say about biography and her reservations about biography. And I think that's what launched me really. That's what started me off. What about um, you? Um, I think in my case, um, I also came to, it was, it was saint exupéry and I, I came to it yes. from, love of the page of the work itself, which I think has been a constant for me. I don't, I'm not sure you could write about someone whose pages you didn't want to read and then reread endlessly. Um, I had beginner's luck with that book in the sense that um, I think there's a biographical sweet spot um, documentation wise, which is after the age of the invention of the typewriter and before the invention of email. And this was, you know, as you have fortunately worked as well, this really tilled that particular piece of ground. So there were a lot of papers, there were letters, um, he had lived both in the America, he had lived both in France and in America. Much of the creative work was actually done in New York. And mm -hmm. because of that, um, no one had really written, the, the life was bifurcated. No one had really written intelligently from both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and still there were many people who had flown with him, not only um, some of the pioneers of aviation who had flown with him, who were miraculously still around in their 90s, Wonderful. but young American officers who had flown with him during the war when he was himself a, a wreck of a 40 year old flyer. And they were very young, impressionable men who couldn't figure out what he was doing in an, air, mm -hmm. in an aircraft. So there was this enormous chorus of. And also, I think I was lucky in that uh, writers are writing about hardest of because they essentially, and in this case, Santa Exupéry was always in trouble. So that old dramatic about keep your hero in trouble really held. Um, <laughs> and it's a short life, which is another, which is another advantage always. Um, yes, always, it's know, very, and also to, you, it's, it's unusual, isn't it? To have a, to have a writer who is also a, a, a daring man of action. Uh, uh, I mean, whether you're writing about a man or a woman, that's not so common. Most writers are sitting in their rooms. And we can talk about this, but there's a penetration too of the work and the life. I mean, much of the work, although billed as um, fiction, and obviously the Little Prince isn't, doesn't fall in this category, is memoir. And so there's a, it was a very, it was a particularly rich vein in terms of connecting work and life. And even by the time you get to the Little Prince and um, like as was the case with Lorraine Hansberry with her Shirley Jackson, this was an author who was known primarily for one book today. Um, you can begin to unravel parts of the life that have got into it. And I'm very struck by your saying that you start from the you start from the basic point of view that you're interested in the writing and that you like the writing. And I think in that we're very alike. I mean, I couldn't imagine writing about um, 
any subject other than a literary subject, although it's been very interesting for me to move from writing about novelists to writing about a playwright. Um, but I also couldn't imagine spending five or six years, as one does, on a writer that I didn't enormously admire and like. And so that's a given, I think, for both of us. And then the task is, is all the time to work out. I mean, I know you've written on on Cleopatra and, and Franklin, who are other things than, than writers. I mean, Franklin is obviously also a writer and Cleopatra has her own um, challenges. But, but for me, it's always going to be writers. Um, uh, and then there is how you do that transition and that negotiation between the work and the life, because it's not straightforward and it's not simple. So that, for instance, if you're writing about a subject who is constantly going back in time, like uh, in my case, Penelope Fitzgerald, who will write a novel 12 years after the experiences of, you know, living on a sinking barge on the River Thames or something like that. And then, you know, many years later, she'll write offshore. Uh, you, have the, you have the simple questions of structure, like do you, do you write about the events of that novel at the time that she's living it, or do you save it up and write, it, write about it when she's in, in the chronology? So all those structural things become very fascinating when you're trying to juggle the life and the work. Well, that's actually, it brings me to something that you did so artfully, and obviously I want to talk about Stopper desperately here, but you, you bring rock and roll, which is what, a 2006 play, I think, into the story 70 years before it's written. And you, and you just managed somehow to, to fold it into our narrative. So was there a conscious sense of wanting to integrate the two for early yes. on in the, in the pages? So I'm terribly glad you, you spotted that because you always are a little nervous if you bring something in long before its time is due, as it were, in the, in the life story. But because I was telling uh, this very dramatic story of the family's flight, first from Nazi invaded Czechoslovakia and then from Japanese invaded Singapore um, during the course of which his father, Tom Stoppard's father was killed and the, and the family, the mother taking her two little boys to, to India and Britain, beginning to bring them up there and then, and then moving, moving to England. Um, uh, clearly, right from the beginning of the story, there's an, a tremendous element of luck and chance uh, and in his case, good luck. Uh, so that, for instance, his mother didn't take them back to communist occupied Czechoslovakia as it then was after the end of, of the war. And so many, many decades later, uh, in 2006, uh, he came to write this play called Rock and Roll, in which there is kind of uh, somewhat suppressed, but there is a sort of alternative life uh, lived by a character who does uh, choose to go back from England to Czechoslovakia and does grow up. Uh, under Soviet uh, oppression in uh, in Czechoslovakia, and his original name in the play was Thomas, which was Tom Stoppard's original Czech name. He ended up being called Jan, um, but I thought it was right to point just to point to that right at the beginning, so that we could see when we came back to it how the curve of the life had led to the writing of that play, and then onwards again to the writing of his most recent play, Leopoldstadt. So can we talk about that transition that you made from um, writing about novelists to writing about a playwright and, and more to the point, writing about someone who is, perish the thought, alive. Um, I'm thinking about this wonderful story that you probably know that Harold Nicholson tells where in a biography of Edward VII, the notorious glutton, um, came up the question of how to treat his gluttony, how diplomatically to write about a man who essentially pounced on his food at the table. And I think the biographer's formula became something like, he was a man of splendid appetite who never toyed with his food. So, <laughs> so I would have said question, he was a glutton. <laughs> so would I, but, but right. times have changed. Um, but Mike, but so my, have you, did you feel yourself, or do you feel yourself, especially in a case like this one, um, protectively whitewashing or needing to protectively whitewash in any way? And just more generally, how was it to write about a, a subject who's still with us. Yeah. Well, it's sort of a double question, really. Isn't it? It's moving from novels to, to, to plays and also writing about a living subject. I mean, you and I have both had the experience before this of writing about a, a subject who is recent enough in this world for her relations 
uh, to still be living. So um, in your case, you had some Nabokovs still on the scene. Uh, and in my case with Penelope Fitzgerald, the grown up children of Penelope Fitzgerald, uh, and indeed many of her friends were all very alert to what I was doing. And the, the Penelope Fitzgerald's children were very generous and helpful to me, but they were also sensitive. And so one would be if one's mother was having a life written of her, you would be sensitive. Right. Um, so that's not always straightforward. Um, so going from writing about novelists, writing about playwrights, that was fantastically exciting for me. And that was the big challenge because I'm not a fully paid up theatre person. I mean, I love the theatre and, you, you know, I, I've been interested in his plays um, forever, uh, but I, you know, I'm I'm not the sort of person you'd expect to be writing the standard life of Harold Pinter, or, 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 or you know, not in that world. So this was an adventure for me, and it was exciting, and it's difficult because um, partly just structurally, this is, and partly because this is a person of enormous energy. Um, novelists tend to write one book, and then they finish that book, and then they write the next book. And they tend not to go back to their novels and change them radically. Doesn't often happen. Whereas Stoppard, not only is he writing a play, but he'll be in rehearsal with three other productions of his previous plays. He'll be doing a radio play, he'll be doing some television, he'll be doing some screenplay work. He'll be giving talks, he'll be traveling, he's got family. So I sometimes felt, I don't know if you ever have this feeling, that I, I resented the linear Nature of writing. I wanted to be able to do it like music so I could have sort of big chords on the page and do six things at once so that the reader would actually be reading six things at once. So structurally, that was quite challenging, actually. And the other thing, of course, is that if you're looking, as we always are, not crudely for simple relationships between the life and the work, but looking to see how the life gets turned into the work, of course, a playwright is pretending to be a whole lot of different people. And Stoppard is notoriously quicksilver about the different opinions and personalities that he assumes and takes up. So you quite often have to look to see where he stands. Uh, he's not a confessional playwright by any means. Um, and so in a way, although if you're writing about someone like Virginia Woolf, you are writing about someone who is very eager to conceal herself within formal structures and rhythms and so on, and, and stream of consciousness, did not want to write a kind of egotistical novel, um, as she often said. Uh, you can still detect her in her works in an interesting way. It's sometimes harder to detect the presence of Stoppard when he's playing games or working with translations or, you know, being wonderfully silly as he sometimes is. So that's an interesting challenge in itself. Because he's splintered the personality into various yeah. characters as well. Um, I have 17 questions for you on that subject, but to go back, did you feel he was, I mean, just on a base level, did you feel he was looking over your shoulder in a way that oh, Virginia Woolf yes, wasn't looking over your shoulder? I Freudianly forgot the, no, I'm the sorry most to important ask you, part I, of you. I shiver, I shiver even to ask you that question because this no, is no, something no, I've never um, had the courage to do. No, it's, it, it, it is, of course, a very peculiar thing to have set out to do. And he asked me to do it. And I said, yes, immediately without stopping to think, because why would you turn down an opportunity like that? And about two seconds later, I said, Oh my God, what have I done? Um, actually, it was a very interesting process. It's, it took about six years, during the course of which I had a, a number of, probably a dozen very long conversations with him in which nothing was off limits. Although I could tell when he was getting bored because I was asking him things he'd often been asked. And then occasionally I would ask him something which I thought was rather minor, like what kind of clothes did he wear in the 1970s? And then there was something this fantastic <laughs> riff about mistress's shoes and all these ruffles and scarves and things, and crazy shirts, you know, that was great. So you never quite knew when he'd fire up. Uh, the things that were clearly, not exactly off limits, but which he, he wanted me to be uh, careful about were the lives of his four sons who are all grown up and living their lives and have their own families. And that seemed to me absolutely correct, that if you are writing the life of a, a living subject who has a living family, you're not writing their life story. 
you shouldn't be going into areas which would be embarrassing or difficult for them. Of course, they need to be characters in Tom Stoppard's life when they are children growing up with him as their father. Because one of the things that people don't know about is Tom Stoppard as a father. Uh, and so I did do quite a lot of descriptions of this shattered figure who'd been up all night writing the real thing, appearing in a sort of silk dressing gown at the family breakfast and hiding behind a cloud of cigarettes and his newspapers <laughs> every morning, because I find that very funny, because um, that was sort of their image of him um, for quite a while. But he was clearly a, a good and loving and friendly father, and, and a very, and still is, you know. So uh, that was, that I had to be, I needed to be careful with that. If you are writing the life of a living person who has been involved with a large number of other people who are also alive, you have the benefit of talking to some of those people. Uh, you have to also be aware that they know that what they say is going to appear in the book you are writing about him and that he will read it. And so they don't want to be worried about him. <laughs> because they want to keep their friendship with him. So I was aware that there might be people saying very wonderful things about Tom Stoppard to me because they wanted to see those in the book. And I think what you have to do there, as you well know, is to keep looking at different, keep asking different people, looking at different stuff. Actually, the version you get of him in the theatre world, which is not a world free of spite and malice in, in its own way, though it can also be a very kind and generous world, is an extraordinarily appreciative version. I mean, generally, he is much liked and admired. I feel as if that's one of the pitfalls. And the other obvious one is the um, self-aggrandizement of the living witnesses. I cannot tell you how many Wellesley girls assured me they were the she was the model for Lolita or the number of people who absolutely had been the person to give Saint-Exupéry his watercolors with which he painted the little prince. I mean, there's a certain sense of putting Yes. The survivors putting themselves back into the drama. Yes. Or Isn't it telling extraordinary? things which are completely wrong, by the way. Isn't it extraordinary? You'd think people would run a mile rather than be identified with Lolita. Apparently not. I can give you the list. Um, but it, it's, it's hard because, you know, way you have that wonderful Greek chorus, but there's also the, the, you know, there's that old Russian adage about no one lies like an eyewitness. And yes. you do, you know, I do, you do sometimes feel you have to discount or at least vaguely distrust um, some of that testimony as rich as it is and as much as one misses it when one heads back further back into the past. It's an interesting thing in the context of the theatre world, because uh, which is mainly his world, although he's also involved in movies as well and, and in radio. Uh, but in the theatre world, what, although he is a person who likes to go on working with the same people, so he has had a sort of team around him and very important directors such as, you know, Peter Wood in the early days who, who did a number of his, his plays. What tends to happen is that people will work very intensively with him on a single play or two or three plays and then, and then he'll be working with another group of people. So that in a sense contains that natural impulse in the witness to say, I've been one of the most important people in his life. I mean, very often you're talking to directors who are very interesting to talk to about Stoppard because he works in the rehearsal room so much, unlike some playwrights. And he's changing his text as well, which is very extraordinary, unlike most novelists. Um, and they will, they will come on very intensively about the plays they've worked with him on, but they won't want to talk about the plays they didn't work with him on. So in a way, that's a correction, a corrective, I mean. Um, and, it, and it speaks to how beautifully you've made you able to sew those pieces together. And the book is truly magnificent. Well, thank um, you. And, and one of the things I think I want to know is how did you so deftly weave um, things like you, you need to have, make the narrative come to a full stop to compare lines of Stoppard with lines of Wild, or you need to bring us something a little bit anyway on chaos theory. How do you decide where to how to braid those things into your into the into the narrative without leaving the reader sort of sitting by the wayside waiting for feeling she's waiting for the bus. Yes. Well, I'm sure there were some readers who who felt they were waiting for the bus that that they wanted me to stop talking about Arcadia and get on with the story. Um, and so I slightly felt I don't know if you've ever had this feeling that I had a sort of double readership in a way, which is that there are clearly re I can see this from the reviews. I mean, there are clearly people who love all the stuff about society and family and marriages and, uh, you know, uh, his big public social persona. And, 
and who can take or leave a careful account of the coast of Utopia, that great nine hour epic about 19th century Russian revolutionaries. And then there are other readers who just love all the stuff about Coast of Utopia and the influence of Isaiah Berlin and Turgenev and, and so on, on his writing of that, that, that play, which of course fascinates me, and who are less interested in his garden parties, if I can put it like that. So I don't mind that. I, I quite like writing a portmanteau book where, you know, both kinds of readers can be satisfied. What, interesting that you mentioned chaos theory. I mean, when I got to plays like Hapgood. You didn't expect me to understand that, did you? Um, I hoped you might understand as much I as I understood by the time I'd finished trying to explain it to myself. I think that's what I was doing. I was running along behind him. He has this astonishing sort of capacious and magpie mind where he, you know, all kinds of ideas will come and there will also be an extraordinary yoking together of ideas you don't expect to be yoked together. So in Arcadia, you've got chaos theory, you've also got um, Byron, and you've also got 18th century landscape gardening. Um, and nobody else puts that together in one play, actually. And so in order to make that, I just wanted to work out what he was doing and how. And so I needed to give myself some education as I went along. Much easier for me when I got to the plays about A. Hausman or the plays about Russian 19th century you know, thinkers and writers, because I'm more on sort of home territory there. So the feeling is somehow gathering together and let the reader make his decision about what he might like to read or what she might not like to read. Well, do you ever do you ever feel that that there are going to be people more interested in Saint Exupéry as a as a as a flyer than as a writer? That there are going to be people more interested in Franklin as a diplomat than 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 as a than as a writer? Do, do you ever feel that? that sense that you're, you're, you're catering for different interests? I guess I tend to think the narrative is all that matters and getting the story to, getting the reader to turn the page is really my job. So yes. I'm hoping that that reader who cares about diplomacy might also read about Franklin the writer and that the person who cares about Franklin the writer might also be just ever so vaguely interested in diplomacy. Yes. And that yes, I'm willing to, to read about chaos theory because Hermione Lee has written it. So <laughs> I guess I'm, I guess I'm hoping that that I'm nimble enough to have given everyone a bit of what yeah. he wants, but the important part obviously is keeping the narrative going. Well, and, if and I may, place, can I turn this back to you? Because I, I, I'm very struck by your narrative, uh, oomph, your narrative energy and skills, and you really do make us want to race along with you. I mean, the Cleopatra book is a, just a roller coaster ride. It's absolutely extraordinary. But I was very, I wanted to read you something from Witches. Um, uh, and this struck me very much is a, a couple of sentences in, um, in your late, in that book. And it goes like this, things disturb us in the night. Sometimes they are our consciences. Sometimes they are our secrets. Sometimes they are our fears. And I thought, gosh, that's a very remarkable thing to do in a in a historical biography of this, you know, this the witches of um, the witch trials in Salem, because you make us immediately feel this book is this matters to me. This book is going to get me where my own fears and secrets and anxieties are. So you you clearly think about that, don't you? How to how to lure in the reader to make them mind. Part of that was not simply luring in the reader, but being able to place what seems this utterly delusional um, moment in time in some sort of rational context and to make them make these people feel less cardboard, more yeah. approachable, more like us. Um, because, and I think this is why I started the book where I did, and I want to talk to you about beginnings. Um, it starts with a woman who's um, flying to a satanic Sabbath. Um, on a stick and has a breakdown, has a malfunction of her stick and crashes in a field and hurts her leg and then continues on to the satanic Sabbath to which she has taken cheese and bread, which she has packed ahead of time for her Sabbath. And she testifies to this in a court of law. So she believes she has done this. And you know, those moments in the archive where you come across something and you think, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but this is this is going yes. in the book. I mean, I always knew that that piece of testimony was hugely, I don't know, I just, I couldn't let it go 
because the idea that someone could convince herself that she had actually done that or was mm. willing to testify to it under oath, one or the mm. other, I'm just, you know, was astonishing to me, but you somehow have to buy into the delusion of that year. Yes. You somehow have to be able to feel the darkness and the fears yes. and that sense of contagion, which by the way, feels very uh, proximate right now, obviously. Absolutely. Yes, it's um, a very and I, proximate. And I thought that was my job. Yeah. I thought that was my and, job. Was and and somehow, it's, it's very, it's very bold and, and, and daring. I, I was, as you were talking, I was saying, I've never actually had to deal with, with a subject who has, uh, you know, who lives in an unreal world, who has delusions or illusions. I mean, Virginia Woolf had breakdowns, um, but I think, you know, the main part of Virginia Woolf's life is a triumph of, uh, of intelligence and achievement rather than, you know, vic victimhood. Um, but I, I remember having conversations about this with my friend Roy Foster, who's a, a wonderful Irish historian whose book on Yeats, you, a terrific biography of Yeats. Which you may, so Roy Foster had to deal with Yeats's mythological systems because uh, you can't write about Yeats with writing, without writing about those, you know, eras of, re, um, you know, uh, all these cyclical ideas of mythical history. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I love Yeats's poetry, but I think it's a load of Cotswollop, really. Um, but Roy managed to write about it without taking that tone ever. And I think that's what you had to do with your witches. You weren't, you, you needed right from the first sentence not to take a tone of, well, look, none of us believes in this, but here, this is what these people believed in. It's not like that at all for you. You've got to make us feel that, that this is what they thought was happening. I think it was to make something feel completely rational that was totally irrational, and then later to prove why it had been so irrational. And that was, you know, that was the assignment. But you bring up something that's so fascinating, which is the sympathy one feels or doesn't feel for one subject, and how it how it occasionally abates, or at least how one how a subject can veer a little bit out of one's affections. Um, have you had that experience? And do you feel that there are some subjects with whom, um, who you feel have, let me put it this way, have resisted you um, yes. more than others? And I'm imagining yes, you're going to say Penelope Fitzgerald, but perhaps I'm wrong. No, I, I deeply loved Penelope Fitzgerald. I knew her a little bit and I was, I loved her mischievousness and her evasiveness and her maddening resistance to being found out about. I, I deeply enjoyed all that. As a matter of fact, the person I did find implacable uh, was Willa Cather. Um, I'm, I'm a great admirer of Willa Cather's work and I still can't read My Antonia or The Professor's House without tears streaming down my cheeks. I, I, I think she's just a, a, a genius. As a person to write about, and I was writing in the era of prohibition when the letters, the many, many letters that she wrote had not yet been allowed to be published. I think that they had to wait for the very last second cousin to die before the will could be overturned, which is an extremely, you know, and she, she hated, I mean, like many people of her era, but she hated the idea of publicity and of intrusion into her life. As a result, of course, she got the worst of all possible work because everybody told her story um, and told about her, her feelings of love for her women friends, all of all of that, and her, you know, cantankerous treatment of her family quite often. But they didn't use her own words, they paraphrased. So actually that's the, that's the worst thing that can happen to a posthumous life. But as I worked on, on writing about her, I found her an absolutely resistant subject. It was like climbing up a steep cliff of rather slippery texture. Um, and I didn't warm to her as a person actually. And I think that can happen, that one can tremendously love and admire the work and not particularly warm to the person. Have you admit, had I, yeah, I will admit I wouldn't necessarily want to spend a vacation with Vera Nabokov. Um, for all of her for all of her genius, for all of her um, extraordinary literary acumen, there's yeah, there's not a warm, um, a warm and cuddly soul there necessarily. But she was fabulous company, and I think that's yes. another thing is that yes. you sometimes don't realize. I mean, it's very hard sending them off or sending dispatching them or leaving them behind when you finish a book. Yes, and, and they it and you is. often have it's often an unexpected. Um, there's an unexpected haunting afterwards of, of that Do you person. miss them? Do you always miss them? Um, you know, at first you're very happy 
first they overstay their welcome. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Um, they overstay their welcome. They smoke too much. You know, they're, they're a little loud in the middle of the night. Their relatives tend to call. Um, and then, I, then you're very happy to dispatch them, if only because it makes your publisher happy. And mm -hmm. then there's a deep emptiness, I think. And, mm -hmm. and I think I'd, I'm not going to press you on this, but I think a, 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 a hurrying um, sense toward the next subject. Yes. You um, so do miss them. I was working, um, uh, I had taken some some sabbatical time off the university uh, when I was working on my Virginia Woolf biography. Um, and I, uh, my husband was going in and out to, to work as, a, as an academic. And uh, there was a day when he came back from work and I came down the stairs of the house uh, weeping. And he said, what's the matter? And I said, well, she's dead. I, I killed her today. Um, and he said, yay. You know, he was he was just kind of acting out what I was. I suppose I was also partly feeling that I was getting towards the end. But then actually with her, one of the extraordinary things about working on her is that you have the diary. Uh, and you have the diary right up to the last day. And I well remember sitting in the Berg um, uh, uh, research um, just in, in New York, um, in, in the library. And the, the diaries are little bound books. They're not like day diaries, you know, she just writes in a volume and binds it. And then, and I, I remember getting to the last page of, of, of the diary and going and, and going on turning the pages, although I knew, of course, the pages were going to be empty. Um, and being, yes, completely haunted by losing the sound of, um, of her voice in my ear. And it was a bereavement, actually. And with, with Stoppard, it turned into a, a, a very nice working relationship, working friendship, because he's been very generous and helpful, uh, having got over his first feelings of, oh, my God, are we really going to do this? You know, and then he, he was, you know, he wasn't like Beckett, who said to his first biographer, I will neither help nor hinder. Um, Stoppard did help and he didn't hinder, uh, though he did used to say to me, well, you're on your own, you know, <laughs> but he gave me some source material of the utmost importance and we had these conversations and then, you know, I, I'm sure I'll still bump into him here and there, but that working relationship is over and yeah, I shall really miss that. That was a very nice part of my, the last six or seven years of my life. I think that I think the you're on your own, you know, is the biographer's motto, just for the record. Um, there's an opposite um, version of what you just described with killing off the subject when he kills off Henry James, about how um, he basically writes the last line. He's completely happy to have dispatched James and he puts on a coat and tie and he goes to his club. And he's as happy as can be because he's essentially unloaded his subject of, of many years. And, for, and he tells the first person to whom, whom he meets with him, he's having a drink that he's just basically killed off James and and the friend is just utterly undone. Like, what will you do now? How, you know, you poor thing, you've killed him off. And it's exactly the opposite of, of your husband's moment of triumph. Um, if you have a big reveal, if you're part of the way um, through a biography and you know you have to work up to something like a secret from, a, from your subject's past that he hasn't yet come to terms with, do, do you feel, I, I'm wondering how you decided to slip Stoppard's Jewish revelation into the into the talk magazine um, coping with it. And if you felt you had to telegraph in advance that we had this enormous um, enormous piece of information coming that was really going to thoroughly color his next years of work. Well, I I I want to I wanted to tell the story um, pretty much as it unfolded rather than I mean I did do that little bit about rock and roll early on because I felt it needed to be there as a pointer but otherwise I tried actually not to anticipate or forecast or preempt I don't much like doing that um, and one of the extraordinary things about this story is that this is someone who grew up as an assimilated English public school boy from the age of eight uh, who knew very well that his father was Jewish and and that, that and knew very and knew perfectly well that his mother was Jewish too, but had never really inquired into 
what had happened, he knew his father had been killed trying to leave Singapore. Um, uh, his mother had married an English major who turned out to be a somewhat xenophobic and indeed anti-Semitic character. And she completely, as many people of that generation did, she, she, she tried to assimilate for the sake of her boys. She didn't speak at home. She didn't talk about her past. She didn't tell her children that a number of members of her family uh, had been killed in the Holocaust. Um, we don't know when she found that out. Uh, it wasn't until Stoppard met a cousin uh, of theirs who drew his family tree for him on the on a napkin at a restaurant table at the National Theatre. And he, he says to Saka, were we Jewish? I, meaning entirely Jewish? And she says, of course you're Jewish. Um, and she then tells him what's happened to all these relations in the family tree and the answer is Terezin and Auschwitz and that actual scene is replay is written in the article that he wrote uh, in the 90s um, on, which was called on turning out to be Jewish I don't think he gave it that name and then returns in in Leopoldstadt as the climax of of Leopoldstadt now it wasn't that he didn't know his parents were Jewish it was that his mother associated Jewishness with the Orthodox Jews that she would see in Zlin in in what was then Czechoslovakia. She was not a practicing Jew. She was not a particularly religious person. She was not a believer. She, as 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 he said, and as has happened to many other people, it was Hitler who turned her into a Jew, who made her aware of her Jewishness. Um, and the fact that he didn't ask her very much about this and the fact that he didn't write about it until after she died because he knew it would upset her and she didn't want to be asked those questions is actually, I think, a tribute to his relationship with her. It is also an extraordinary piece of um, not wanting to go there for whatever reasons. Isn't that a great, isn't that a line of Virginia Woolf somewhere about listening to what people don't say and transcribing what gets unsaid? It yes. seems to me that so much of the our job is say. Um, mm. not reading the silence necessarily, but um, the things people crossed out. There's nothing better than a crossed out mention in a diary to the yes. biographer. Sure. Um, 